welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, natural healing is the topic. As you know, if you've been following our show over the many years, we like to bring modalities to you where you can find non-invasive ways to perhaps heal things that most people like to consider using things such as deep psychotherapy and perhaps even prescription drugs. But today we bring something very unique where we actually bring the integrative yoga practice into what is known as trauma treatment. Our guest today works internationally, and her method is a safe and effective integration of trauma-informed yoga and somatic psychotherapy to align the mind and body. It's designed for professionals to use who are trained in both yoga and psychotherapy, especially those specializing in disassociative identity disorders. She is the author and licensed psychotherapist, as well as yoga teacher, trainer, trained to bring yoga into trauma treatment. She is also the founder of the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery, which is located in Oakland, California. And three of her books that she has authored is Embodied Healing, How You Can Heal, and A Strength-Based Guide to Trauma Recovery. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program, our guest, Lisa Danielchuk. Lisa, thank you for being on the program today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Now, I hope I got that last name correct. Dan Alchuk, yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> I would want to create one. trauma before the show starts on a <laughs> last name. That's a very unique name. I like it. But tell us how you got started in all this. What led you down this path? Well, you know, one thing I, I often tell people is I never really had one field without the other. So I've always been interested in somatics and movement and and yoga and counseling and healing and working with people in an interpersonal way. So what's been interesting for me is as I've learned about psychology and kind of trauma treatment, I've always been in my own yoga practice and developing that um, along the same lines. And so for me, it's really clear how the two connect. um, And I just want to share that with people. Now, I understand that uh, sort of the evolution of this thing, did it actually start at Massachusetts Correctional Institution? Is that true? So that was one of the, my early volunteer classes. Okay. Um, yeah, so you know, I started teaching before that when I was in Southern California. And then when I was in graduate school um, out in Cambridge, I had a fellow classmate who was recruiting me pretty heavily. I think she had volunteered with a program at the institution, she said, oh, you got to bring yoga, you got to bring yoga. And of course, being a busy grad student, I said, okay, we just got to find a time. We just have to find a time. And finally, we did. And, and that, that was a, a huge, I would say, learning experience for me. And it was very eye-opening as to how helpful even just a few sessions can be. Now, it's really unique because people might think, well, yoga and trauma, how do those two things go together? But actually, uh, as I understand, people who actually begin uh, the practice of yoga actually find things coming up through the uh, practice, especially in the beginning times. Tell us about that. Well, I think what's happening in the yoga world right now is there's a little more awareness slowly being cultivated of trauma just as, as a phenomenon and dissociation as well because what happens for many people is they get on their yoga mat and they start moving around and breathing and the instructor says something like close your eyes and go inside and then they do that to some degree at least and go oh wow what's this <laughs> right where is this coming from and and memories can come up associations um even just somatic experiences, things in the body, um, emotions, like it's really common for people to cry at the end of a yoga class or in the middle of it or just to feel strong feelings. And so I think people who hold space for yoga practitioners, studio owners, teachers, they're starting to see, oh, wow, this is really powerful. It can bring up a lot. And I think a lot of yoga teachers feel like, what do I do with that? Right? If someone comes to me after class and they're sharing a story or they're asking for help, sometimes they you know, want to help or be there, but to like, this is kind of out of, my, out of my scope of training. So then we start to learn about trauma. 
I see. You know, because as I was looking through uh, your book, it was really unique when I was seeing things that, to me, were quite different. Because we've talked about yoga on the program over the years, but it's more for, you know, health and well-being. If you want to improve your energy, you know, mindset, things like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, trauma and yoga, to me, this would be sort of the first time in many years we've been doing the program. We've brought those two things together. So if you could, for the listeners, kind of really give an idea how these two really went hand in hand and how you came to develop this whole thing. Well, again, there's so many ways that they connect. Um, and I think one of the main things is, you know, like a yoga practice, especially in the U.S. these days, and, and I think internationally, is a little bit more asana or posture focused, right? So there's a lot of body focus there. Some philosophy too, definitely, but your general drop-in class is going to be a lot of movement, a little bit of stillness, and Psychotherapy still tends to be largely talk focused. There are tons of modalities, um, hypnotherapy, EMDR, biofeedback, there are all kinds of things that can incorporate the body. But what I see, if you really boil it down, is yoga's developed this more body focus, psychotherapy's developed, and psychology has more of this mind focus. And when you pair the two together skillfully, you really can do what we talk about in terms of having a mind-body connection, right? Like things can come up in a yoga practice that probably wouldn't in a psychotherapy setting, especially if it's interpersonal face-to-face. So I think putting them together, and whether that's in a yoga studio or a specialized setting or an office space, a private practice, putting them together can really do what we say so much of in integrative healing and, and connect body and mind and energy and spirit and all these other layers, too. You know, because when you take a look at what we're talking about here, people, you know, it's trying to get them to see, okay, now I think I really see the connection here. Because, for instance, I know that in your book you have a pyramid. I believe it's the Ace Pyramid. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about what that is specifically for a minute. Because when you think about trauma, sometimes it can be very subtle. But over mm-hmm. time, uh, you know, let's just say it's a small thing. You know, uh, mm-hmm. it could be maybe you were in a classroom. It could have been the third grade. Perhaps the teacher did something, uh, maybe punished you in a way that was embarrassing, uh, you know, really made you feel pretty low about yourself. And then over the years, you, you kind of get over that. But somehow that pain gets buried into the body somewhere. And certainly we've talked about, you know, emotional trauma going into the body and actually creating, you know, pain in certain areas, uh, at which over time as the body stresses that area, the body tries to adjust itself in other ways, and pretty soon you can see sort of the systematic way the body begins to break down over something that might, let's say, start at an elbow. That kind of seems kind of silly and extreme in a way, but you can see it systematically moving throughout the body, and the next thing you know, perhaps, and I'm just maybe mm-hmm. stretching a bit, uh, the emotional connection of, say, cancer, you know. And mm-hmm. so when you look at that, you look at what we're talking about here as the yoga practice because people think of it as bending and stretching and these kinds of things. You're actually going back into the body, as you mentioned earlier, and mm-hmm. therefore you begin to say, you know, I never thought about it this way before. You know, I didn't know that was there until somehow I was guided or directed in that direction. And that's kind of how I wanted to shape that. Precisely. Yeah, and when we look at that pyramid diagram, right, we're talking about adverse childhood experiences, which you know, we're finding now are linked to health outcomes, right? So you made that connection to cancer, but people are finding many things like heart disease and strokes being more common in young people who have had what we would call complex developmental trauma, right? So complex trauma meaning multiple experiences of trauma and developmental trauma meaning it's happening as you're developing. Now, of course, we're all developing across the lifespan, but between zero and say 26 or so, there's a lot of brain development happening and there's a lot of kind of mental and emotional, social development, occupational, right, career development happening as well. So when things happen early on, like you said, that third grade example, it can shift how people are feeling about themselves, shift the way they see the outside world. That 
experience sitting in a chair at a desk in the third grade can sort of make an energetic imprint. And particularly if we do, if we do have some identification with it, oh, the teacher shamed me, that means I'm bad or I'm not smart or whatever else. Even half consciously, subconsciously, we can carry that forward without being super aware of it. And so then, yeah, you can sit in a yoga class and go, what's that uncomfortable feeling in my gut? Like, or why do I think, that, why does a teacher keep calling me out, right? Sort of an enactment of the same thing in the third grade. And, and so that, those things can come up in life, on the mat. And when they are more subtle, like what you're describing, you know, it, it's not, you know, like an earthquake or some, some big tragic event, when they are more subtle, sometimes they're harder to pick up on. And I think that's when it really takes those skills of, of psychotherapy to hone in on, okay, well, what's happening now? Where did this start? You know, and I think EMDR is a great method for getting into like, what's, what, where did this come from? <laughs> right? Sometimes right. the therapist mm -hmm. would never guess, but if someone's doing hypnosis or EMDR or some kind of depth work, they can go, oh, and sometimes that depth work is shavasana at the end of a yoga class. It's resting and, and not cognitively working to try to find it, but sort of allowing maybe if we want to be general, the more sort of creative or right side of your brain to, to just provide a memory or a sensation or, or an answer, right, a connection as to where where the roots of that, you know, traumatic experience or or early sort of development of identity started. Now, I like that it's trauma-informed yoga. Tell us how that works. I think we've pretty much hit it here, but, you know, just so we can kind of hit it home where people go, okay, I get it now. Yeah, well, one of the reasons it's called trauma-informed is not every, not every yoga leader or teacher is going to be a therapist. I mean, there is a growing number of, of people, there's a growing population of, of people who have yoga certifications and mental health degrees or licenses. So there's definitely that overlap that's growing. But in terms of the yoga community, some people have a yoga career and, and don't really have an interest in being a mental health professional or, or doing even private work in that way. So trauma-informed means we, and I actually like to call it even human-informed yoga, because trauma is just the study of how we respond to really stressful experiences, right? Extreme stress, not just, oh, I have a test tomorrow, but, you know, something like even you said, if there's something in school where, you know, you, you get shamed or bullied or if there is something really violent or something like that, um, looking at how people respond to those things and incorporating it into how we teach is what we would call trauma-informed, right? So there can be trauma-informed law enforcement. <laughs> there can be trauma-informed fitness classes. I don't, you know, that, that's not so popular yet, but I'm hoping it gets there. And I think trauma-informed yoga is just let's study what we know about human beings and how they respond to hard things and be aware of how that might come up, particularly when we're doing this physical, mental, emotional, body, mind, spirit practice. Because in yoga a little bit different than most fitness classes, you're actually inviting that into the room. You're, often people are speaking to healing qualities or, you know, there's this integrative aspect, like bring all parts of yourself onto the mat. And if we all really do that, if we're honest, we're going to bring some raw or unhealed experiences that we haven't digested yet. So trauma-informed yoga means teachers even studio owners, people who are, are holding space for those yoga students, understand right, what might come up, how that might manifest, and ideally understand how to support people in their healing without having to make it necessarily treatment. So trauma-informed yoga could also be a yoga group at a hospital or a yoga group in a clinic, definitely, but it, but it can also just be let's learn from, from what the mental health world knows and let's just kind of make our policies around that, help um, other teachers and help the community just be a little more mindful in the way that it's teaching. So just to, I think it's really unique to take a look at this because imagine that you're a yoga instructor. You've got your class full of people and they're doing their thing and then all of a sudden 
one of them just seems to break down and you're just standing there almost like a deer in headlights. What do I do now? I didn't expect this. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you try to figure out the next step to take, and that's really a lot of what your Yoga for Trauma Recovery book is about. Yeah, and I think on two, kind of the flip side too, so there's the times where someone has, you know, sort of a really emotional, a strong emotional experience in class. Maybe they're crying or they're angry or they want to walk out or I haven't seen this as often, but does can happen, does happen. They want to create conflict, right? So those things can happen. People can go into full on um, even sort of different states in their body or in their mind and and so, yeah, important for yoga teachers to have the skills to respond to that. And there's even just some simple things we can do to help people uh, move through, especially if it's kind of a flashback or um, an intrusive memory. On the flip side, I think a lot is happening even when that doesn't happen. So yoga teachers often want that information, right? They'll come to a training and say, what do I do if someone gets triggered? And so we'll talk about that and also say, you know, a lot of times you don't know when someone's triggered. They might quietly leave. (laughs) They might sort of endure class and never come back. They might not even know they're triggered. So I think we also have to be aware of there are times kind of like the quiet kid in the classroom. It doesn't mean they're not having problems. They might just be more shutting down or isolating or withdrawing. And even adults, you know, most of us can go to a class and move through it, and we might have all kinds of emotional stuff going on, but we're adulting, so, you know, we're respectful. (laughs) So I think it's important that we're able to speak to both the kind of demonstrative displays of triggers and just be aware of the subtle ones. So, So through the book, right, I talk about just the different ways that trauma can manifest, and it might just be observing someone's body. A lot of times we don't know, right, exactly what's happening in someone else's experience unless we communicate about it. Uh, but we can make some, some sort of inference and make some choices as space holders to offer ways people can, can ground themselves, can work with intense feeling, even if it's not um, kind of spilling out onto the mat. I know you gave an example of a young a woman, uh, Sandra, I believe was her name, and it seemed to her that what it, you know, this trauma came out of nowhere. And the most uh, important thing to to relate in this story here is how you were just mainly just present. Sometimes that's just about all you need to do for a lot of people is just be there where they can feel that the place is safe for them to allow this to come out. And a lot of times we're all intelligent enough, most of us anyway, and healthy enough mentally, I would think, that we can kind of find our own life's journey and a way to heal that. You know, certainly seeking out a professional can be a good idea if that's the point you feel that you're at. But this seemed to be a situation where she, you know, was allowed to let this out to see it right there in front of her and then maybe take the next necessary steps toward healing. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think as a therapist and as a yoga teacher, sometimes it's just being with someone while they're going through something. It's, you, know, you can be an anchor just in your own presence, uh, whether it's through listening or just holding space um, in a non-judgmental kind of patient, loving way. You know, I have a curious question, and I always find this to be a unique phenomenon, especially when you think of the world of physics, you know, the idea that once you bring your attention to something, you begin to see and experience mm-hmm. more of that. And mm-hmm. I would wonder, as you started your yoga practice and this began to come into your world, the idea of trauma and these things coming out perhaps in the studio or on the mat, did you begin to see more and more of that when you realized well, here was a tool I didn't expect to have to develop and use. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What, what happened, actually, that's interesting, I feel like people come to me and tell me their stories of how they got triggered in yoga. <laughs> like, oh, wow. You won't, believe, you won't believe what happened, right? Like, mm-hmm. this happened, and I, I laughed, or this happened, and I cried, or this happened, and I never went back to that studio again, or whatever it is. And so I hear a lot of different stories of how people get triggered or, you know, that can manifest in in being 
angry or being sad or being hurt or all kinds of different combinations of that. And it's so interesting to me how there are sort of the obvious ones. In the book, I give one example um, of an adjustment, a, a hands-on assist I received that was, I think, inappropriate, right? But it, it didn't trigger me, but I was oh, like, got an adjustment in happy baby pose. It's like, you know, you don't know me. You probably shouldn't be putting your hands there. Um, so there are those things, but then there are also times where people come to me and they can't, you know, maybe there's a simple posture that brings up a lot for them, like mountain pose, tadasana, standing. So if standing and giving attention to your feet brings up memories of your particular trauma, well then, you know, what do you do? Where do you go with that? And I think those types of really specific triggers, especially if they're very overwhelming, are, are better addressed in a one-on-one -on -one setting because, you know, you'd be hard-pressed to find a yoga class without a, a mountain pose or without a downward dog or without these sort of very common practices. You're also hard-pressed to find a yoga class that doesn't emphasize breath, right? And for some people, breathing is too much, right? It, wow. it brings up all of especially if someone has maybe a, a really complex history of something like ritual abuse, right, where there's all this violence, you know, the imprint of violence held in the body. If someone's associated that, right, if their body's holding, right, people say the body bears the burden, the body keeps the score. These are also popular book titles, right? So if someone is really holding just an atrocious amount of trauma, right, like a, a lot of childhood trauma, then something as simple as closing your eyes, breathing, paying attention to any aspect of your body can, can be flooding, essentially. It can just bring up too much pain. So with that, right, <laughs> basically so many things potentially can be a trigger in a yoga class. And so that's something that was interesting for me as, as people would come with their different stories. Oh, well, there was something red in the room. Oh, well, uh, there were deities. Oh, well, it, you know the lights were too bright. <laughs> There's just so many things. Like I was just at a, a conference in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago and someone gave the example, a lawnmower could be a trigger. Like we just don't know because trauma is a human experience and human experience is like infinitely complex in, in how it occurs. It's really impossible to create a completely trigger-free environment. Now, can we kind of be aware of what the people we're working with might have been through and be sensitive to that? Absolutely. Uh, but I think part of the magic of yoga is you actually do get to work with those things to figure out that they're there and work with them. And it's hard. It could be hard to do that if you're if you're in a classroom with someone who's not aware of trauma or isn't sort of skilled and and helping you move through it. You, you know, you're so right about things in this world that can trigger us in ways. And as we have brought a lot of experts in different ways into this to see, you know, get people, you see the triggers, you kind of mainly sit with them and, and, and kind of ask questions, for instance, for instance, paying attention to your thoughts and I know there was an experience I had many years ago where I was about to board a MAX system uh, mm -hmm. where I was bringing my dog along, and this woman was actually asking the driver about that. Is this okay? Mm. And it was a conversation I wasn't involved in, but I caught it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go over there. You know, here we are initially – it seems innocent enough I'm walking over and deciding to be part of this conversation because mm -hmm. down deep inside me, not knowing yet, the Hulk was beginning to boil. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. And wow. I got to a level where, you know, I was letting this woman really have it, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then I just walked away. You know, even the dryer was like, well, you know, hey, she was just asking me a question about this. And that's really all it really was. It had nothing to do with me except for the fact that here I was with a dog, so I made it about me. Mm -hmm. I get on this thing, and I'm sitting there, and I can just feel this rage inside of me. But yeah. I also had this presence of mind to go, where in the hell is this coming from? I'm yeah. a pretty chilled guy. <laughs> yeah. And I realized what it was. 
and it was and I and I could see and I'm I'm bringing this up as a, a good example I hope for the listeners to see the kind of work that you're talking about what your book is about here and as I sat with it I realized all the years in school and growing up that I had spent where somebody else was in control of the outcomes that directly affected me without me yep. having a say in it. Yep. You, you can see that, right? Yeah. And it was absolutely. just in realizing that I went, wow. And I took deep breaths. And at the time I was with my wife, and she was just sitting there much like you would be in your classroom. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm letting this out going, holy son of a gun. <laughs> it yeah. started small. You didn't even know it was coming. And then there it was. And there I was ready to just tear up the city, you know, kind of a thing. And I realized what I had done, and I felt very sad that I blew this woman right out of the water. Mm-hmm. But I had the opportunity to see her, and I walked out and I went right in front of her, and I said, I want to deeply apologize for what I have done right. here. And, and And she was like, Okay, cool, but you could see it in her face like that screwed her whole day had it not been for me being able to go back and talk to her about this. But that's not an opportunity a lot of us have from day to day and minute to minute. So it's just that aware, you know. So anyway, (laughs) I can see what you deal with. (laughs) Right, but even the awareness, like where is this coming from? And I think when, when we are triggered, I mean, almost by definition, we're like, not aware, right? right? Not aware of what's happening. So something comes up and out, and it's it takes so much practice and intention, and I think humility to be able to go, what is that about, right? Rather than like you could have been in that situation and just made a story about how dare she ask a question and how dare you know, you know, I have the right to have, you could have made it about the dog, you could have made it about other things, but instead you're like, where did that feeling come from in me? Um, and so that takes a certain amount of, of willingness to inquire, of awareness. I think as we practice um, healing in whatever way that we do, that the timeline gets a little shorter. So, you know, you could have been triggered for days or weeks, right? And, exactly. You know. That's what I realized that now that I've caught this, I'm going to catch more moments because you can feel that's the, yeah. the cool thing about the body is this, is that it's designed to be a radar and antenna. You know, and these are yeah. wonderful things that I've been able to have so many aha moments having a program like the one we've been producing for a lot of years is people like yourself mm-hmm. come on and I go, you know, I didn't see it that way before. And, and after a while, you find yourself in the world with people kind of coming across you with this, and you say, you know, here's something you might want to take a look at that I found does this. You know, you don't try to solve their problem, but you give them a way where they can think about how maybe they can go about doing that. And, you know, yeah. this is one of those situations, for instance, that I was describing in myself where I realized, you know, it started in my stomach. Somehow, yep. then the thought began to go, okay, this is what this is, and then the story came along, and then the experiences yep. just flooded me, and then that's where the rage came from, as there was so many of them. Mm-hmm. Now, when that happens again, I can be aware of, okay, I'm catching this, but let's take a look at this and really do an inquiry, like, is this true that this person's really trying to take away all your decisions? No, mm-hmm. she's having a conversation, you know, is this okay? Okay, well, that should be okay with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty unique that way. And it leads me to, a, a, I guess, a question for someone like you who I'm sure is very passionate about, you know, teaching yoga and leading classes that when sometimes, and I don't know how often, but as I said, once you have that come into your awareness, it seems to happen more and more. Do, you know, do they get the people like you? Can you become burned out feeling like I'm here to teach yoga, not be a psychotherapist? And how maybe you can avoid that? And I think that's a lot of also what your book is also about, isn't it? Right. Yeah, I definitely speak to that in the book. And I think whether it's a yoga teacher or or someone in mental health or both, you know, there's the risk of burnout and what we would call vicarious trauma, right? Particularly if you're working with a lot of intensity, whether that's somatic intensity or you know, emotional or interpersonal, I think all of, both of these things can be all of the above. 
when that's happening, like we have to, as providers, do exactly what you were just describing and be really aware of our own internal state, right? And our own reasons for doing the work. So, you know, classically, some people will go into helping professions because it's easier to help other people than it is to work on ourselves. So one of the things I highlight throughout the book is how important it is for us to keep noticing those times when we're angry, noticing when our bodies start to feel pain. Um, you know, as therapists, another great reason to incorporate somatic, you know, practices, movement, yoga, is sitting in a chair isn't really the healthiest thing. <laughs> and, and so sitting in a chair and, and digesting, processing this really heavy emotional material, also a lot, right? So we have to develop ways to be aware of what's happening not just mentally, but emotionally, um, energetically, physically, somatically, even socially, right? To kind of see how is how is this how am I relating to my work, and what is it bringing up in me? And if we're human, then we have some experiences, and you know, when we were eight, when we were sixteen, however old, where it, there's an imprint. So I think it's essential that providers do their own work, right, whether that's your own yoga practice, your own psychotherapy, um, both, even beyond that, other things. So often this conversation goes to self-care. I like to incorporate support, too, because we're social creatures. We don't just take care of ourselves. We do take care of each other, and there can be really good things in that. But one of the things I talk about in the book is also just allowing uh, for growth, right? And I think the field of yoga is evolving, definitely. There have been multiple crises and even scandals in the yoga world lately, uh, in the mindfulness world as well, even in, in some you know, leaders in trauma therapy. So we have to keep sort of questioning and learning and growing. And I think we, we burn out maybe when there's you know, too much trauma content as opposed to sort of normal everyday life. But we also burn out when, and this is my experience, is if we, we stop learning or we kind of go on autopilot and just go, oh, okay, well, that's the sequence I'll teach for the rest of my life. It's like, okay, well. That's sort of maybe. like try eating pizza for dinner every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> exactly. And your yeah. body How's will that working out, out for you? <laughs> right? Your body will be like, no more pizza. I mean, one story I can tell, I was working with a clinic in Oakland um, years ago, and I was working with survivors of commercial sexual exploitation, and many of them were still being exploited. And so these were mostly young women. And, you know, in that work, you can bring so much of your own energy just to building a relationship with someone. Right, and, and so I remember having like a client that moved, and just like my, my supervisor saying, "Are you ready to take another client?" And I just couldn't find it within my body. <laughs> right, like, right. I don't have the That's energy. That's understandable. Well, think about and like people that, who are actually in like the food service industry, day in and day out. You're dealing with people, and you know their moods and the ways they come in, and well, I'm paying sure. for this, so I expect this out of you, and it's like. How much more do you think these people can take? And then on top of that, you want to stiff them on a check after you've ran them around all over the place. You know, it's like, right. goodness. So I can see what yeah. you're talking about, sure. And then the other piece that I noticed at that point was, you know, I was working with these young women. Some of them were very young, like early teens, and they had just tragic histories. Wow. And I, I stopped, like I started to feel like that was the norm in almost like a half-conscious way. And the, the moment I remember around this similar time where I felt that emotional, like I can't build a relationship with another client right now, I just don't have it in me, literally, like uh, the energy is not there. I remember going to a park and seeing kids playing with their parents, right? Pretty everyday thing, right? You could go to a park probably right now and find some kids and their parents, you know, hey, get off the swing, come over here, have fun, whatever. And I was watching this happen and it didn't feel normal. It felt like the exception. It, it felt in my world like all kids get abused and these are the lucky ones. And it is true that I think for most people abuse is more common than we think, but 
I also recognized in that moment, whoa, I used to live in a world where I didn't even notice kids playing at the park because that was just kids play at the park with their parents, right? That, that happens. And so it was a, it was a reminder. It was another sort of thing for me to notice of, oh, I'm burning out, <laughs> right? Right. So we when you start to, to see everything there. as this is the way it is everywhere, you know, as I, I see what you're talking about. Everything is, any, and, and really, and even in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is relatively, you know, straightforward and even simplistic at times, it, it's like looking at how our worldview is and what we think and how that makes us feel, right? So I was starting to think, I was starting to develop this cognitive distortion that all children are abused, right? And all children are not violently abused, right? Like that's just not, they're not, all children are not sexually exploited. So it was getting this like black or white thinking going, right? Right. Rather than seeing the shades of color that are all around that like this is the experience of my clients, this is the experience of my friend's daughter or whatever else. Um, so I, I did notice, oh, wow, my worldview is being impacted and I need to back up. I need to back up a little and sort of anchor myself. And I did start spending time more with my friends who had kids and just thinking about what great parents they were, right? And I don't think any childhood is perfect without any harm ever done, without any emotional misunderstandings or harm. But but it was, oh, let me open up the way I'm seeing again so that I'm not kind of going down with the ship in a sense, like I'm not getting pulled into, sometimes we'll call it a trauma vortex, right, where feelings and the emotions and the experiences are so strong that it's hard to see or feel anything else and particularly anything good or positive or what we might call resourcing. You know, you bring up too something that I think is very valuable as an insight is that sometimes as say, someone like you in your practice, especially in the very beginning, or any of us, uh, we decide to take on a a particular thing that we want to have an impact and change in the world. As we begin to do it again, as I mentioned earlier, as you focus on something, you begin to see and experience more of it, and pretty soon Mm -hmm. you can Mm -hmm. find yourself in a realm where, goodness gracious, the world is big. How do I make an impact on all this? And then you stand there doing nothing. And I can Mm -hmm. imagine that I probably wonder, because there was a part in your book I was reading about where you were at Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was... Because, I mean, you really get around. We're not talking about somebody who sits in a studio all day long. I mean, (laughs) you actually get out there and you get around. So I could see where you could go... Goodness, how much more do you think I could take? <laughs> I didn't know this was my work. You know, I don't remember Saint being on my identification card from the DMV, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> but I do think we also have a pretty natural inclination when there's a disaster or when there's something really traumatic that happens to want to help, right? People say, right. what can I do? Mm-hmm. Tell me what I can do, right? Oh, like, you know, something happens, there's a fire or an earthquake, and, People donate, you know, all over the world. People donate five dollars. They they do what they can. They they volunteer. They're, like people, I think, have an innate, um, and, and I think this is healthy. Like I was mentioning earlier, we can go to the unhealthy side where we're ignoring ourselves and you know don't have any boundaries. But but I think there's a innate social response uh, that we're connected and to want to help. And so when there's something like the earthquake in Haiti, I was actually around a lot of people who wanted to help and were, you know, getting on wait lists to go with certain organizations. And I I knew someone locally here who I had met who was Haitian, and she was bringing a small group there. And it was so interesting because you talk about being one person, right? There were these organizations doing great work there, but we were four people, you know, driving around. Her mom still lived in Haiti, so her mom drove us around. And um, Sandrine, who was leading the trip, taught aguaponics, right? So growing, being able to grow vegetables essentially on top of a a fish tank. (laughs) Um, She also taught how to build houses out of tires that people could just pick up on the side of the road uh, with tires and, you know, old Coke bottles and things like that. And then I taught yoga classes, and Stella, who was with us, translated because she was native um, from Haiti, so she spoke Haitian Creole. So I would teach yoga, she would translate, she would help Sandrine teach these other classes. And we were just going around to 
whoever her mom could organize wanted to listen and saying, hey, here's some, here's some tools that might help you right now given the fact that you had an earthquake a few months ago. And in terms of yoga, I would share and Stella would translate, hey, these are poses that tend, we, t- we know tend to be helpful for grief or sadness, right? So if you're feeling sad or if you're feeling low or if you're feeling anxious, like yoga teaches that these postures, these breathing um, exercises might be helpful to you. And, you know, those moments where you say something like that and then, you know, half an hour later you see kids spontaneously dropping into camel pose because, you know, 30 minutes before you said this is good for grief are really touching because that makes a difference for that kid. You know, maybe it changes their emotional experience. Maybe it helps them cope with grief. But even before that, it gives them a sense that there's some tool, like there's something they can do when they're feeling sad. And who wouldn't feel sad given a devastating earthquake like sure. that, right? And mm-hmm. So it was really nice and really moving for me to be a part of that group. And I, I felt honored because, again, I had friends who were like, I'm waiting for the Red Cross or I'm, you know, signed up and on a wait list to go out there. And I just kind of got invited with this smaller more local group and and I think we did really touch the lives of the people we met with we also had space to connect with them we were a smaller group Um, most of the groups we met with were maybe 30 people or so so we could hang out intermingle have conversations and I think we forget in terms of whole health how important in the face of a tragedy, it is to just have other people around and even feel a little bit of a sense of normalcy of like, let's, let's talk, right? Let's, right. let's address the fact that this thing has happened, you know, yeah, let's find tools, but let's also just feel connected to each other. I think that's a huge piece. Well, and the other thing too, is you brought up a really wonderful uh, thing for people to reflect on too. And it reminded me of a story that was uh, told many years ago that I thought really hits at home when you kind of look at a problem or a challenge in the world and then you realize, I'd like to do something about this, but then you compound the reality of the fact the world is a big place and you're just one person. And Mm -hmm. when you talk about how you have the camel pose to these children in Haiti because they came to know, well, you know, this can actually help with grief. So, you know, you left them with a tool. You made a difference right there to one, two, or three, or who knows. And the story was real simple. It was about someone who decided to go to the beach with the intention of committing suicide. Mm -hmm. And as they were sitting on the rock, they noticed off in the distance somebody walking toward them, and every couple of steps or so, they would lean over, reach for the sand, and then they'd see the arm fling into the air. And after watching this for a while, this woman who had this intention of just never seeing these experiences again because she decided the world just wasn't worth living in due to the pain she was suffering, went down to the beach, and as she went down, began approaching this person, realized all these starfish all over the beach just sitting on the sand in the sunlight. And Uh she noticed what was happening is this young boy was actually picking up a starfish and throwing it into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And she went up and asked, well, what are you doing? And the the boy simply replied, well, I'm putting these starfish back in the ocean. If they stay out here on the beach, the sun's going to bake them and they'll all die. And she Mm -hmm. says, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of starfish here. How do you suppose you're going to save them all? And he says, well, I don't know, but... He reached down, he picked up a starfish, flung it into the ocean. He says, I just made a difference to that one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, that's about as simple exactly. as it gets. And it leads me, yeah. you know, as we talk about people like yourself, and, you know, you're out there and you're doing the work that you do. And, and like you said, when you were talking about the sexual uh, trauma uh, situation you were in, you began to see things, you know, in that sort of black and white way. You know, that another thing to really do, too, is sometimes people get gung-ho in a leadership role where they believe, you know, that they're doing this healing work, but sometimes they don't walk a personal talk, mm-hmm. you know. And so I guess a good question to ask is, you know, how uh, people can begin to ask themselves, well, if you're practicing peacefulness and self-reflection, for instance, is it different for you than what you're telling other people to do? Mm-hmm. You see, there's a real difference because I remember 
there was someone who was involved with, I think it was Site K, said, I spend a lot of time, at least two to three hours a day, every single day doing clearing, so that when I go and I help someone, I'm doing it in clear, full intention. So I'm not throwing any of my garbage on them, because people will actually receive and pick these things up. You know, we see that a lot of the world today, what you might call hypocrisy, and it's not that it's intentional, but there it is, you know, and I thought that would be an important thing for us to bring up in this discussion. And, you know, what what more of one type of trauma is betrayal trauma, right, and that often happens in families, but what more of a betrayal than to go to someone in your moment of need and one of your moments of need and look to them as an example and do everything they say and then find out they don't do it. (laughs) Right. Right. Because that's almost like they don't believe in it or or they think that they're different from you. And there are certainly circumstances where, you know, someone has a vitamin C deficiency, you need to take vitamin C, maybe not everyone needs that. But in terms of, I think you're, you're speaking to authenticity in a way, but you're also speaking to, I think, one of the most powerful forms of learning, definitely for me as a student, is modeling, right? And so I can think of, three yoga teachers I went to really early on who never talked about trauma. They didn't use those words, and they didn't really even share their personal history. But a decade later, I learned that they had been through something similar to me or similar to someone in my family, and that they had used yoga to work through it, and that yoga had been really helpful for them. So there's something about the way that they're teaching, the way that they exist within their own bodies, or even if you want to go there, the energy field they create around them, right, the, the space that they hold that I connected to early on, and I felt safe and comfortable there, and I felt like there was leadership happening, even though they might have been talking about how to refine the position of your shoulders in chaturanga, <laughs> or they might have been <laughs> playing rock music while we were right. doing yoga, or they might have been sort of snarky sometimes and made, you know, off-color jokes, um, <laughs> hopefully right. not harmful ones, but, you know, sarcastic jokes. So people can have all different styles, but if they're modeling something that um, and, and sort of holding that within them, I think that's one of the strongest teachings. And so that also connects, too, to what you were saying earlier of sometimes even just being with someone when they're recognizing a truth or they're saying something out loud or they're feeling something intense and being with them can be really powerful. Now, do you think it would be powerful if I had all all these unresolved feelings or I had never dealt with my own grief? Or Probably not because it would be triggering instead of, Right? Like what we learn from going to our own things often is just how to be loving or kind or patient or at minimum non-judgmental when someone else is, is also experiencing those things. We learn to do that with ourselves and then we can kind of be that presence for other people. So I think the modeling is essential and I think the continuing to grow ourselves right, is not only how we prevent burnout, but also how we continue to serve people. It also reminds me, as you're talking about this, of um, you know, carrying the world on your shoulders versus being a human being on the planet. Right. <laughs> Those are very different <laughs> proportions. You're not made here to carry everybody else. You're made here to carry yourself. And maybe along the way, if you can help a few people, that's not such a bad thing. You can thing, pick yeah. up a starfish, pick right. it up, right? <laughs> if, you're, if you're walking on the beach and you have the, mind, you have the awareness to notice the starfish and to think, hey, maybe I'll help it out if I throw it back in, great. And right, it's, we're going to live and die and, and all of the problems of the world are not going to be resolved. Like I, I sort of sadly and pretty confidently can say everything is not going to be fixed by the time I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> so there is some world peace is a great idea, that. but well, I don't know about my lifetime. <laughs> I mean, look, if you look back and look forward, I'm like, how many more years do I have? And how many years of all this craziness <laughs> have been happening? I mean, I don't think I'm going to fix everything, and I think acknowledging that and accepting that does make it a little bit more, um, it it almost helps us stay present. This is where I am in time and space. This is what I can do. And, hey, this is also, like, I'm riding on the planet, right? So I'm going to try to 
treat the planet with respect so I can stay on the ride. But I'm also going to just, you know, okay, this is what I can do in the time that I'm here. This is how many starfish I can pick up on my morning walk um, before I have to go to work or whatever. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of, of perspective in that that we – we model, but we also, I think there's an element of acceptance of, um, of life as it is. You know, and it also brings me, and I thought this would be uh, another uh, unique way that we could actually end the conversation here, and that is, you know, you as a leader, uh, as you teach your yoga classes and as you integrate the uh, way of helping people to heal trauma, help them to have the tools that they have so perhaps they can go on their own and do these things, you know, without you. They can do these things on their own, much as the children in Haiti is. <laughs> and I've found this often because I like to go to, as I'm invited to go to workshops or the seminars uh, a lot of times after interviews that I've done. And <laughs> there's nothing more <laughs> entertaining than guru status. And I say this is true because what happens once you get that puppy dog that you fed that just never wants to go away and all of their problems are all yours now and without you, they just don't make it at all. <laughs> How do you address that? See, this is something you rarely ever hear people talk about. But, yeah. you know, first that guru status is you sit there and you see this guy going in front of 1,500 people in his pajamas, yep. sitting on a couch or a bed, getting everybody yep. to say, oh, you're inevitably going to get 10% of these people that are going to follow you all over the world no matter where you go. You know, yep. if there's nothing rock and roll hasn't taught us, it's about the groupies. What, because right. after a while, you're going to get tired of seeing these people. <laughs> How do you deal yep. with that one? <laughs> Well, I think that boils down to power and power dynamics, right, and the importance of being able to own our own bodies and minds and make our own decisions. And, you know, life throws us a lot of decisions to make, and sometimes it feels a lot easier to say, what does the guru have to say about this? Let me go to the book. Let me go. Like, and sometimes we can use those things in an anchoring way. Okay, well, let me... Let me go and meditate and reflect on some aphorism. Okay. But it can go to the degree you're describing where let me go rub the guru's feet and, you know, magically maybe something will appear or people even lose themselves in, in those dynamics. And I think what's happening in the yoga community is we're seeing that the gurus also are have and, and do abuse that power, right? Many have, right? And we're, we're seeing evidence of that sort of bubbling to the surface in the last few years even. So when we look at power and healthy power dynamics, right, I've had some great teachers who I'll ask them a question and I'll want them to tell me an answer and they ask me a question in response, <laughs> right? There you go, right. And I'm like, damn it. What are your <laughs> thoughts on this exactly? <laughs> right, so I'll say, well, what do you think I should do? And maybe, maybe they don't just go, what do you think you should do? But maybe they say, you know, well, how do you? What do you think the best course of action in this moment is that you're aware of? You know, kind of. The, I get. Yeah. Or even, you know, what do you feel when you think about doing A? What do you feel when you think about doing B? And I think therapists do a lot of that, and in therapy, and in the yoga world, and in any combination of you know, trauma informed yoga or yoga informed therapy, like it's important that we recognize as a leader or as a professional, like we are in a position of power. Um, and, and acknowledge that and really make efforts to create healthy dynamics so that if someone's in a place, and it's very common to have a traumatic experience and feel disempowered because it's not like we wake up and go, oh, I've been notified there's going to be an earthquake at 10-11, or oh, I, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to you know, this unexpected violent experience. Like We don't choose that. It's not scheduled. We don't know. So there can be an experience of very real victimization. There can be an experience of disempowerment that's, that's common with a lot of types of trauma. So with that, how do we retain or rebuild a sense of agency, a sense of power, and how do providers in these worlds who are helping, particularly people who have experienced trauma of different sorts, how do we sort of remind them, like, you do right. have power, you do have agency, even though this thing happened, even though that didn't go as you wanted, even though you couldn't save your friend, 
that doesn't wash out, you know, that you have choice and, and that your actions matter. And so I think if it can be tempting, I'm sure, to go, oh, I'm a guru. I'm amazing. You want to sit and be this all day? Great. Oh, wow. I There's my collection I basket. Good. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Like, I, I always thought I wasn't worthy, but now that you're feeding me grapes, I feel really amazing. So, thank, like, and that's sort of falling unconsciously into, uh, or consciously falling into, like, unhealthy dynamics, maybe even falling into your own, you know, trauma history there. So that's where doing our work, staying grounded and, you know, keeping aware of healthy power dynamics, I think can really serve everyone because what happens, like, is it really fulfilling to lay on your bed and eat grapes all day? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. But, um, but I don't think it's healthy at the end of the day when one person has all this power and people are following them blindly. Um, I don't think that kind of, you know, blind allegiance would even really right. feel satisfying. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm reminded too, uh, uh, as we get to the end here of uh, the movie. I think it's called The Legend of Bagger Vance, uh, starring Will mm-hmm. Smith. Uh, set back, it's a, a golf movie, but there's a scene where uh, where the guy that uh, he caddies for. Just, you know, in the end, we're going to die alone. That's just the way it is. And then and, and Bagger Vance just say, you know, you got a real hard eye. So what you're basically telling me is so the Lord gives us birth. You know, we're coming to this world with a soul. and We're given everything we need. And, well, when things just don't go your way, you're just going to kind of throw it all away. Is that the, w- w- what you're telling me? That's a real hard eye you got there. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, but sometimes people are just that way, and I guess sometimes do you find yourself, you have to simply say, well, you know, I've done about the best I could do, you know. I, I suppose this journey is up to you now. Yeah. Yeah, and I think sometimes as as a teacher or a mental health professional, setting our own boundaries can be the most healthy thing for someone, right? So, no, I'm not going to come over to your house at 4 a.m. <laughs> no, I'm not going to pick up my phone in the middle of the night. That's not the arrangement we have. Like, that's what 911 is for. That's what you know, crisis hotlines are for. Um, and trusting, you know, and there are times where people need to be in the hospital, need 24-hour uh, care. But there are also times where ha- having boundaries can send the message, I know you can do this, <laughs> right? Right. And you can have that conversation as well. So I think even for yoga teachers that feel like, oh, my God, someone came up to me at the end of class and they told me they remembered how they were abused when they were five. And sometimes asking the question to that person, God, what supports do you have? Like, who's helping you with this? can be the most helpful thing, right? Not right. just going, I'm the yoga teacher and I'm your guru and I'm going to save you. It's like, well, that's probably not going to happen. And if, you know, you get struck by lightning tomorrow, then then they, they don't have anyone. So right. rather than, you know, being the guru that's going to resolve everything, can you actually help build a community that's healthy and, and that where people can support each other? Um, can you kind of encourage people to to have a solid basis of support rather than just one thing. And that I think is what, you know, yoga practices are good for too because people can wake up at 4 a.m. and go, oh, I'm feeling really anxious. Let me try, let me try this, you know, three to four breaths that worked really well for me, you know, in my last therapy session or whatever. And then there's a tool that, that transcends the relationship or time. Yeah, it's funny when we you keep bringing up Tool because I keep remembering uh, one last story was uh, many years ago, I think I was in my early 20s, a friend of mine ended up with a broken clutch cable on a truck that he had. So I pulled out my Leatherman knife and we went and got the clutch cable and it was a really easy thing to go and fix. He gets out, test drives, and the cable breaks. So we get another cable and he says, you know, I, I'm going to need this by 6 o'clock. All of a sudden, his problem for getting somewhere was all now left up to me to fix this car. And I said, really? Well, here's the tool that I used. You better get working. 
you know, I just realized in that <laughs> moment, it's not my problem if you don't get to your appointment at six on a broken car that you own. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that that taught me, wow, you know, this is how you stop, you set the boundary, you know, that you want to do good, but it's also up to someone else to get up and walk as well. So, you know, that's the important right. thing. Right, and yeah. his problem was all of a sudden becoming your problem. Exactly. It's a shared yeah. thing, you're not in this together. It's like, yeah. hey, fix it for me. Uh, that's not really how it works. We yeah. can fix it together. You can fix it. I can teach you how I would fix it, but mm-hmm. yeah. So I'm listeners, do you hear what we're saying? Video. Lisa and I are telling you, yeah, you've got those. Maybe we can help you with tools, but in the end, mm-hmm. get up and walk. You're going to enjoy the fact that you learn to fish rather than just somebody giving you one, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Now, speaking of that, how can people find out more about your work and maybe how they can get your book, Yoga for Trauma Recovery? So um, online, uh, my website's lisadanilchuck.com. You have to be able to spell it, <laughs> which is Lisa, D-A-N-Y-L-C-H-U-K.com. Uh, also, I have an easier website. It's How We Can Heal. Mm-hmm. So How and We Can Heal. And the book's available on, yeah, howwecanheal.com. The book's also available on Rutledge, the publisher's website, um, lots of other booksellers online. So it's pretty easy Google search or any search for that matter, Yoga for Trauma Recovery. Well, very good, Lisa. Thank you so much for being on the program. What a wonderful conversation this was. And, you know, and uh, hopefully we'll get that opportunity to do it again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. You bet. Take care, Lisa. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.